Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Lauren Maloney, and I'm the Food Safety Program Accreditation Manager for Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc. And today, I'm going to give a presentation on Food Safety Modernization Act, FSVP, and VQIP. I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that the slides and recording will be available on the website after the webinar. And if you have any questions as the web webinar goes along, feel free to type them in the question box and I will answer them at the end. There'll be plenty of time for a question and answer. So welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, tell you a little bit about Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc. We were founded in 2012 by Perry Johnson. It's a sister company to uh, the Perry Johnson family of companies, and we are focused specifically on food safety audits and certification. We are a global certification body uh, with headquarters in the U.S. and um, offices around, around the world. We are accredited by the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, um, for our GFSI schemes of SQF, BRC, Global Gap. And we are also accredited um, for our FISMA FSVP VQIP program by ANSI. And ANSI is recognized by the FDA uh, for this program. So let's talk a little bit about the Food Safety Modernization Act. This act uh, changed the legislation by shifting responsibility of food producers um, from just responding to a foodborne illness to actually preventing it. The, the FDA enacted um, seven major rules in order to successfully um, globalize our uh, food safety um, requirements. And those rules include uh, preventive controls for human food, preventive controls for animal food, um, produce rule, foreign supply verification program, or FSVP, which we'll talk more about today, Voluntary Qualified Importer Program, or VQIP, which we'll also talk about today. Sanitary Transportation Rule, and a th Accredited Third Party Certification. So the Preventive Controls for Human Food, um, those are specific requirements for um, entities that uh, produce and manufacture uh, food for human consumption. Um, there's a separate set of uh, rules just specifically for animal food or animal feed. And then um, the produce rule, which is regulation for the growing um, of, of different produces. So those play into the requirements for the foreign supplier verification program, which is uh, specifically for importers and as well as the uh, Voluntary uh, Qualified Importer Program, which is VQIP. So I'll talk a little bit about those later. Um, and then the accredited third party certification, that is actually the rules that allow PJR FSI to conduct consultative and regulatory audits. Um, and so I'll go through the steps of that as well. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about Foreign Supplier Verification Program, FSVP. This program mandates the requirements for importers responsible for bringing food into the U.S. So um, if you're a foreign manufacturer of, of a animal food, human food, or produce that um, you are importing that food into the U.S., the organization that is responsible for bringing it into the U.S. needs to be 
a importer of record located into the US. This is new. Um, that you have to actually have a U.S. importer of record identified in order to get your food in to the U.S. Um, the requirements uh, include insurances that foreign suppliers of the imported food products are complying with applicable FSMA rules. So um, that means that foreign suppliers or foreign manufacturers actually have to follow the same rules as uh, what US-based manufacturers are following. So if you're making uh, bread in, in the US, you need to follow permit controls for human food. And if you're making bread in a foreign country that's going to be imported into the US, you also need to be following permit controls for human food. Same for animal food or produce rule. So uh, in order to uh, make sure that the foreign suppliers are, um, are following the applicable rules, the FSVP requires importers to perform risk-based supplier verification activities. So depending on the um, type of food that is being imported uh, or from the supplier, different um, risk-based activities may be um, required. And so I'll talk more about them in the next slide. Um, there's a few exemptions for foreign supplier verification program. Um, meat, poultry, and eggs that are subject to USDA regulation at the time of entry will be covered by those requirements. Um, fish and fishery products that are in compliance with seafood HACCP and juice compliance with juice HACCP will continue to um, um, follow those HACCP regulations since those were in place um, prior to FSVP, prevent controls, um, or produce rule. So the importers of those products still need to um, have supplier verification activities conducted, but they need to follow the HACCP regulation specifically instead of the prevent controls um, requirements. Um, other exemptions are alcoholic beverages, food that's used for research or evaluation, food um, imported for personal consumption, food that's just going through the U.S., um, food that is imported for processing and then exported back out, or food that is exported and returned without further manufacturing or processing in a foreign country. So importers, um, in order to comply with FSVP requirements, um, they must develop a, a food safety verification program for each food from each supplier that is brought into the US. And this is in order to show that the food that's produced um, has is produced in the same way uh, with the same level of public health protection as um, the US, like as a US manufactured food. So that they follow those preventive controls or the produce safety regulations. The importers have um, a responsibility to, to determine the hazards with each food. And so they need to evaluate the risk um, proposed by a food based off of the hazard analysis and the foreign supplier's performance. Um, the risk may be high from a food that um, is it already has a lot of risk of involved in it, um, maybe raw meat or um, unprocessed um, fruits and vegetables that are going to be eaten raw. Um, so the importer must evaluate that risk of that food. Then they also need to look at the foreign supplier's performance. So if they've been importing from um, a supplier and the, that supplier has numerous recalls that may um, 
you know, make the risk higher. And so they have to take that into consideration. Maybe it's a new uh, supplier and they're not sure of their performance. So they're going to rate that as a higher risk um, and as opposed to a supplier that they've been working with for many years that um, has had no problems um, with their food um, and no um, foodborne illnesses in the past. So using that evaluation um, of the risk, then the importer will need to determine um, if they're approved and what verification activities have to be conducted. Um, they can't just take word for it that the supplier is making safe food. They actually have to conduct their own verification activities. And then they have to actually do those activities. And if there's any corrective actions um, that come from those activities to make sure that, that those are followed up with. So what is a supplier verification? Um, importers have the flexibility to tailor supplier verification activities to the unique food risks and supplier characteristics. Uh, the options include an annual on-site audit of the supplier's facility, um, sampling and testing of the food, um, a, or, and or a review of the supplier's relevant food safety records. So the importer can choose to conduct one or all of these options, uh, depending on, again, that risk and the supplier. It may be different for each, each food. It may be different for each supplier, um, but it needs to be tailored based off of the risk assessment um, that was conducted. So one of the things that PGRFSI can do is perform that annual on-site audit of the supplier's facility and we can conduct that either as a consultative or a regulatory audit. I'll talk a little bit more about the difference later. So voluntary qualifier importer program, VQIP. So VQIP is, is a voluntary program. Um, it's not mandatory, but it's for um, the importers to get their food into the U.S. Um, at an expedited rate. Um, it's, it's a fee-based, which means that um, you apply to, directly to the FDA and pay a fee annually um, in order to um, bring that food into the U.S. faster. Um, the, the benefit of having uh, being part of VQIP is you get that food in there with greater speed and predictability, and you also avoid um, long delays at the point of entry, which could be definitely a benefit to um, foods that are perishable um, or fresh, or frozen, things that uh, delay would could be very costly. So the application period um, is currently open for the VQIP, and again, it the importers will apply directly with the FDA. They will open um, typically through October 1st through March or May 31st each year. So right now, like I said, the application period is open until May 31st um, of this year. Once that applica application period closes, um, the, the benefits will begin um, the next October through the following September, which follows the um, uh, US fiscal calendar, which is why it begins October ends in September. Um, typically, it's gonna be open from January 31st to May 31st, again, with that benefits going from October to September. And if, um, if you want to apply, then you need to do a letter of intent and application which sent through directly through the FDA, FDA website. Um, you can access the link, or you can just Google um, VQIP um, FDA application, and it'll take you there on the FDA website. So why would you want to apply to VQIP? Well, the main, the main um, benefit is quicker and easier entry. Um, 
the FDA will expedite entry into the United States for all foods included in an approved BQIP application. Um, FDA will set screening in its um, predictive risk-based evaluation for dynamic import compliance targeting, or PREDICT, um, import screening system to recognize shipments of food which are the subject of an approved VQIP application to expedite the entry of such food. The system is designed to recognize the information and release the shipment immediately after the receipt of entry information unless examination and sampling are necessary for public health reasons. So if, um, if limited um, uh, if examination and sampling are necessary, it would be for cause situation or when the food is or may be associated with a risk to the public health. Um, to obtain statistically necessary risk-based microbiological samples and to audit VQIP. So they're not going to be doing as much examination and sampling, it'll be limited. Um, and if they do take samples, then um, the sampling would be at a preferred location. The FDA will attempt to the extent possible to examine and entry and collect samples at the VQIP food destination or other location preferred by the VQIP importer. So the importer would be able to identify the preferred location for sampling. Um, those sampling samples would be then sent to the lab and the um, FDA will expedite its laboratory analysis of for cause or audit samples of the VQIP entries to the extent possible in accordance with public health priorities. So if you, if you get those lab results faster and hopefully get the food into the U.S. faster. And finally, they have um, they have created a help desk uh, specifically for VQIP questions where you could submit questions um, to the email and get a response very fairly quickly. Um, this, is, this is specifically for VQIP importers. So that's a benefit to have a direct line to the FDA to raise questions about applying um, for VQIP or um, the benefits or the, the process of it. Um, FDA will post a publicly available list of approved VQIP importers on the FDA VQIP webpage. Uh, however, that's something that is um, optional and the importer could uh, choose to opt out if they, if they don't want that list up there. But if they did, then that would be a great marketing tool. So in order to apply for VQIP, um, you do have to meet some eligibility requirements. And these, again, are eligibility requirements um, for the importer that is applying to the program directly to the FDA. Um, the FDA wants to see a three-year history of importing food into the U.S. Um, the, you'll have to have a universal um, data, universal numbering system, a DUNS number. The food that you import, um, including ones that you do not intend to include in your VCOP application, cannot be subject to an import alert or class one recall at the time you submit your application. This doesn't mean that you can never have a recall in order to submit it. You can, you just can't have anything that's open when you're submitting your application. Um, neither the importer um, nor the non-applicant entities associated with the VQIP food are subject to an ongoing FDA administrative or judicial action. Um, in the past three years, you all have not been the subject of any U.S. customs or border protection penalties, forfeitures, sanctions um, that are related to the safety and security of any FDA regulated product that you've imported or offered for import. Then you must develop and implement a VQIP quality assurance program. And the VQIP quality insurance program um, let me give you definition is 
the is a compilation of the written policies and procedures you will uh, use to ensure adequate adequate control over the safety and security of the foods you import. So the FDA gives a um, component list um, on their website, and it has to have some pretty specific components, including corporate co quality policy statement, organizational structure and functional responsibility, uh, food safety policies and procedures, food defense policy and procedures, uh, qualification, implementation, records, definitions, and so on. And so you can find more details about that um, on the FDA website, exactly what needs to be included on the, in the quality assurance program. It would, and that will also have to be submitted with your application. Um, then once the application is um, accepted, you will have to pay the user fee. And again, this is directly to the FDA. Um, before the uh, benefit period starts. And it's a pretty hefty fee. It's um, $16,000 a year, um, but that covers all of the food for all of the foreign suppliers that you're importing into the US. So if you are applying for a large number of foods um, or a large number of suppliers, foreign suppliers in your application, then that fee, um, you know, is is not as hefty as um, if you're applying for just one, you know, one food or one um, supplier. Depending on depending on how much you're bringing in and um, how much delay there there has been in the past, then it might be worth it for the importer um, to to pay that fee. Um, so who can apply as a VQIP importer? Well, you can be the FSVP or HACCP importer on record, which means that the importer is, um, located in the U S and is, um, th there would be in compliance with that FSVP, um, supplier verification program, uh, either under, FSVP or juice HACCP or seafood HACCP. If you are not uh, the importer on record in the US, um, but you're an importer, um, you're a foreign importer bringing food into the US, you can still apply to the VQIP um, program. You just have to um, identify who the US importer of record is um, on your application. So, Again, you could be a foreign importer bringing food into the US, or you can be a US importer to apply to this program. And then that last piece of eligibility is to have a foreign facility certification. So um, PGRFSI uh, is a third party certification body that's um, accredited by ANSI, and ANSI is recognized by the FDA um, in order for us to offer foreign facility certification. So let's talk a little bit more about what um, the requirements for that. Um, just to go through our scope of accreditation, uh, we have um, human food, juice HACCP, seafood HACCP, produce, acidified foods, low acid canned foods, infant formula, shell eggs, um, preventive controls for animal food, and dietary supplements. That's our FSVP scope. And our VQIP scope includes um, part 112, which is produce rule, part 117, which is preventive controls for human food, um, part 120, which is uh, juice HACCP, and part 123, which is seafood HACCP. So um, there's two types of audits. The first type I'll talk about is a consultative audit that PGRFSI can conduct of foreign facilities. Uh, foreign um, consultative audits can um, either be used as a gap assessment 
um, for the foreign supplier against the applicable FISMA rule. So it is sort of like a pre-assessment where the auditor comes in and looks at the facility, goes through the applicable requirements, and um, writes up a report noting the um, where the facility is um, meeting the requirements and where they're not. Um, this report can then be used by the facility to um, then be able to get their facility ready for a regulatory audit so that they know that they, they will um, be in compliance. Um, or it can just be com conducted um, on its own and given to an importer, uh, you know, once any corrective actions are, are completed, um, given to an importer to show that they are meeting the applicable, applicable uh, regulations. And then that would may be um, one of the uh, supplier verification activities that the importer is requiring. So it could meet the FSV peak requirements. So this, um, this could be used in, in either, either instance for a pre-assessment before the regulatory audit or on its own uh, to, to allow the facility to know where they stand and then to be used as the um, supplier verification for FSVP. The next is um, a regulatory audit. So um, regulatory audits can be completed specifically because an importer is um, applying to VQIP. So um, if you're a foreign facility, um, your US importer may contact you and say, I'm going to be applying to VQIP. Um, I'm, I'm going to have Perry Johnson Food Safety come out and do a regulatory audit of your facility um, and, and um, issue a certificate so that that certificate can be used in the VQIP application. The other instance of conducting a regulatory audit would be if a foreign supplier specifically requests a regulatory audit um, in order to show compliance to the reg regulation. So maybe they don't yet import into the US, but they, but they would like to. Um, so instead of just having a consultative audit um, conducted, they actually would like a regulatory audit and a certificate um, for the for regulatory certification, and then they can use that to give to importers um, to show that they are meeting the U.S. requirements. Um, oh, I think I talked about that a little bit. Uh, the other thing is that you know you can you can also have that regulatory audit and certificate as um, a requirement of FSVP um, that you want them to not just have a consultative audit or an on-site audit annually. They actually want the regulatory audit with the certificate to meet your supplier verification um, program requirements and. Um, and that's another option as well. So uh, we were the first certification body accredited by ANSI um, and approved by the FDA, but in the last uh, few weeks, a few other CBs have um, gained accreditation as well. So what, what process is um, the regulatory audit? Well, like I said before, before you conduct the regulatory audit, you can have a consultative audit. Um, the same auditor would not do a consultative audit and a regulatory audit uh, if they were conducted in less than 13 months. So we would, if you had a consultative audit done, we would send a different auditor for the regulatory audit. Uh, it's actually conducted in two stages. The first stage is a document audit offsite. So um, we would request your documentation, um, such as your preventive control plans, um, HACCP plans, uh, FDA registration information, um, procedures, food safety procedures, and things like that to be sent to us in advance. 
and we would agree we would agree upon a date um, of the stage one. Once the stage one is conducted, um, then we would conduct a unannounced um, regulatory audit of stage two. So that's actually at the foreign facility, um, and it's unannounced, which means we don't tell the site in advance when we're coming. We ask them instead for a 30-day operating window. So um, say that we, you know, the site says, oh, I need my audit to take place in April. And I said, we say, okay, then give us your operating window for the products that you um, want included in the regulatory audit um, for that month. So maybe they don't produce those products on Fridays. Maybe they're only open for three weeks during April, depending on holidays. And then based off of that operating window, we establish blackout periods where we would not show up for the audit um, because we want to see the products in production when, when the audit is taking place. So then uh, the auditor uh, conducts the audit and afterwards um, uh, will give a list of any nonconformities to the site, to the foreign facility that must be closed out um, before certification is granted. The site has 30 days to close out those nonconformities. And then we would review um, and make a certification decision um, by 45 days after the audit. Then the audit report um, will be uploaded uh, to the FDA audit portal, and this is only for regulatory audits. Um, we are required to upload it uh, no matter uh, what the report says, whether or not they are meeting all the requirements or not. Um, and if they've closed out all the nonconformities, then we would include that um, and, and this, as well as the certification information, would all be uploaded to the FDA. Any uh, serious threat to public health that is found um, during an audit will have to be reported immediately. Um, we, our auditors are trained to report, report them immediately to PGRFSI, and then we need to report that to the FDA. So, um, that would be something that uh, would would trigger a recall um, or it was some serious threat where it could um, do a lot of um, harm to the public health. And then the um, certificate is valid for one year. Um, the importer who applies to VQIP um, has to have a certificate for each food that they're going to import into the US, uh, each facility. And they would include that when they um, upload their um, VQIP application with all of their other documentation. They would include those certificates from their foreign suppliers. Um, if the certificate um, expiration date is um, ends within the um, application period, then the new certificate, a new audit, and then a new certificate has to stay current each year. So basically, the foreign facilities need to have um, a new audit every year and issue a new certificate to keep their VQIP um, benefits. All right, so that's a brief overview of the um, FSVP and VQIP program. I'll be happy to take any of your questions. I think there's one here. Let me see if I can take a look at it. So we have a couple questions here. One is we don't have any U.S. importer, we registered under Register Corp. Who should we keep our documents in U.S.? Um, so I guess uh, my question would be that are you um, shipping your products currently into the U.S.? Or 
I think I might have to know a little bit more about your situation um, because under FSVP products that are um, or that that are imported into the U.S. should have a U.S. importer of record um, identified upon entry. So it depends on who you're working with, um, who specifically you're working with, and and then you said you receive online and send products through the mail. Um, that's a good question. So maybe um, you could send me an email after the webinar or you can contact me by phone and we can talk a little further about your situation since it's pretty unique. Um, my number is 248-519-2523 and my email is lmaloney at pjrfsi.com. I'd be happy to talk to you about specific situations, um, uh, you know, that, that apply to FSVP and VQIP. So and another question here, can you use auditors from outside the U.S.? Yes, we can. Actually, we do um, use local auditors around the world. Um, depending on where the foreign facility is located, um, we try to dispatch a local auditor um, as close as possible. So we have headquarters in Europe and Mexico, um, in Japan and in India and in China. Um, so we have quite a few different headquarters. And then within those headquarters, we also have auditors in certain countries. So we try to get as um, local as possible. Typically, we, we don't use auditors um, about we don't use auditors coming from the U.S. to go to foreign facilities. That would be very costly, so we try to use as local as possible. Um, do we have Egypt Egyptian auditors? Um, yes, we do have some Egyptian auditors. So if you want to, um, you know, talk to me further about that, if you're interested in um, learning more about uh, becoming an auditor, we're happy to talk to you about that. Or if you're uh, would like to um, learn more about getting regulatory certification, then feel free to contact me and we can we can discuss it. Okay, well, again, I just want to let you know that the slides and recording will be on the website. Um, uh, it probably takes usually um, 30 minutes or an hour or so to get that uploaded, but then you'll be able to access that. And please feel free to contact me um, with any further questions. And I appreciate your time, and I hope you have a good afternoon.